and this is the second part of the presentation about XTS. In this particular part, we're going to talk about the relationship between XTS and the IT infrastructure technical framework as defined by the Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise or IHC. So as I mentioned in the second part, we're going to talk about how does XTS relate to the ITI technical framework. It is a very critical part of it and how does it relate to all to the other components that make the XTS work. So what is the relationship between XDS and the ITI? Well, you can compare XDS with what I call an engine, and the engine needs other parts to make it work. An engine can make other parts used to make it into a car or a motorcycle. So the same thing happens with XDS itself. It is an information exchange, and it requires, number one, patient reconciliation. When we exchange information, we need to make sure that we know what patient we're talking about for what we exchange the information. Second, we need to have protocol definitions to exchange the information. Then, definitely on the third, we need to have security and privacy measures. Uh, for example, if the information is exchanged over public internet, we need to encode it, we need to encrypt it. And when we want to have access to the information, we need to make sure we have the proper authentication in place. Then fourth, we need to have directories. We need to have white pages and lists for the providers. For example, if we send information for Dr. Smith, we need to know which Dr. Smith we're talking about. Number five, we need to synchronize the workflow. When we send information, we need to tell the receiver what we expect him or her to do. For example, a second read or adding it to an electronic medical record. And then number six, we also need a standard for content templates, codes and encoding. So when we exchange the information, it can be automatically decoded and then incorporated or imported in an electronic health record. So XTS is part of the IHC ITI framework. So it is really the framework of the services, like I just mentioned, that can be used by various domains. It can be used by radiology, cardiology, patient care. So all the domains can use the exchange uh, facility provided by XDS. And then, as like I mentioned before, we're going to talk about the details about XDS in, in another presentation. But XDS itself consists of multiple components. Uh, again, the analogy of the engine, you know, you think about the cylinder, intake, transmission, and so on. Now let us look at a real-life scenario and find out how XDS works. And then after we look at the scenario, we'll highlight the individual profiles that are used to make this work. If you look at this particular slide, you see on the right side a teaching hospital. Let's say a patient goes to the ER at the teaching hospital. Images are added to the packs and the electronic health record has images stored, archived. And then the electronic health record system will archive the document repository, but will register the document with a document registry, which is shown in the center. And just that using a patient ID that's locally known. In the meantime, on the bottom, we see the CT, which is the consistent time server. And we see also the ADNA, which is the profile for logging and documenting authentication, all the transactions. Then all the way on the top, we see the PICS or PDQ query uh, for querying. Because what happens if now on the left side, we have a community clinic and the physician in the community clinic want to query for the document, it can go back to the document registry and find the information and query the document using a patient ID. So the patient identity cross-reference manager, all the way on the top, is used to reference the cross-reference the patient IDs. The registry is used for registering certain documents. And then the document can be retrieved after the patient IDs are properly cross-referenced. And after we find out that uh, in the registry that there are certain documents available for that particular patient. This shows an overview of the different profiles and the different domains that are included. So if you look all the way on the top, right, this is the kind of, I call it the roadmap. On the top left, there is this patient, maybe there's a barcode, for example, or is identified. It's identified locally by the patient registration system. And to be able to manage that correctly, we have the patient identity management profiles, which is PICS, PDQ, and XCPD. So that allows us to properly cross-reference the different patient IDs and to query with the patient data query for the particular information of the patient. Second, we have the information exchange management, which is the XDS family. And we're not going to talk about that in this presentation, but we'll do that in part three. We're going to focus on the environment first. 
So the third one will be the security and privacy management includes consistent time, audit tree logging, and cross-enterprise user authentication. Then there are three more profiles that are sets of profiles that are important. The first one dealing with the provider and personnel management to make sure that we know who we're talking to at the other enterprise, the workflow management, and also the content management. So let's first talk a little bit about the patient identity management profiles. So the patient identity management profiles deal with consistent identification of patients between different enterprises, between different domains. And the first one will be the patient administration management or PAM. That profile is defined to locally manage the patient information. For example, using a hospital information system, an EMR or an EDT system. Second, we need the patient identifier cross-referencing or PICS profile and that allows us to link different patient identifiers from different enterprises and how to link them together. So there will be a cross-reference manager, for example in Health Information Exchange, where you can register using patient identity feeds, these patient IDs, and then allows you to query for particular patient identity or patient IDs that are unique within another enterprise. Then we have the patient demographics query or PDQ to query by demographics. And then if we want to go across different communities that have gateways, for example, we can do that doing the cross-community patient discovery. So this is the set of profiles all needed, depending on the use case, to identify properly a particular patient. The next set of profiles deal with the security and privacy management. So these are the profiles that are used in combination with the policies, for example, who can access what information, with the physical environment, for example, is it connected via bridges, gateways, via DMZs, so it deals with procedures, that organization, the department, and functional, and also the information technology, what is technically available. All of these, in combination, support security and privacy requirements. So these IHC profiles support logging, the privacy and security information. So anytime a transaction takes place, it will be logged in a standard way and um, access that information later on to find out who accessed it, what information, for what reason. Then we have the user and system identification and authentication. We want to make sure that people are properly identified and authenticated. So with the user login, passwords or other means, we need to provide access control. And then data integrity encryption uh, have to deal with the information that is being exchanged in a secure way so that somebody else cannot listen into it. And then we have the digital signatures and privacy consent management so that if somebody signs a consent form at one location that the other locations know about it so the other locations know exactly what can be accessed and what is not allowed to be accessed. Here you see an overview of the different security and privacy controls. It tells you on the left all the different profiles and it tells you when the profiles are issued. And it tells on the right columns, you can see exactly what is provided. For example, the audit log is provided in audit trails and not authentication and consistent time and so on. The provider and personnel directory management are very important because we need to manage the data related to different healthcare providers. So we need to have a healthcare provider directory, HPD profile, that is a standard way of exchanging information about the different providers. It will support organizational and individual providers, for example, Dr. Smith or an organization such as so-and-so clinic, and we can disambiguate the identifier of the providers. And then we can also access provider contact information. For example, if we need to uh, have access to a specialist, a cardiologist, we can have access to the information, for example, how to email or call this particular person. In addition, we also have the personnel white pages profile that provides access to basic human workforce and user directory information so that we know again, Nurse Jones, exactly who is Nurse Jones, or there could be multiple in an organization. The workflow management profile uh, exchanges information about the workflows. And uh, why is that needed? Well, for example, if a document is sent from one enterprise to the other enterprise, uh, there could be certain expectation of what to be done with this document. So we need to be able to exchange what the intentions are, what is the workflow and expectations on the other side for when information is being shared. Now, lastly, I'd like to mention a little bit about the content management. Now, content management deals with the actual information exchange. Now, it really doesn't belong in the ITI, in the IT Infrastructure Technical Framework, but I wanted to highlight it here because it's a critical component to make XDS work. And why is that? Well, if a document is exchanged between two parties, and let's say the document is in the form of a PDF, well, it's easy to just attach that document to a patient folder or a patient record. However, if this document is in an electronic format and it's interpretable, 
For example, if we look at this example, the patient health status, the condition is there, the diagnosis or the problem, the family history, that information has to be encoded in such a way that it can be decoded on the receiver side and all the information can be used to update the patient electronic health record. For example, allergies, that needs to be encoded. For example, that it can be interpreted and put in the proper places. So if the patient is ever being treated at the other facility, that that particular allergy would come up and prevent a particular prescription drug, for example, from being described. So content management, the exchange of information, is a critical part to facilitate the XDS. And most of the documents that are defined uh, as part of the information exchange are based on ITSA 7 version 3, clinical document architecture, CDA, and I list a couple of examples like uh, an XDS MS medical summary, laboratory or uh, extract for the personal health record and so on. And so a whole list of those that are being defined. So these are well-defined templates with coded information in a particular structure that are defined and they have to be in place for the exchange between, between different enterprises to work. So in summary, XDS implementation and the details we're going to talk about in part three. But the XDS requires a supporting infrastructure. We need the patient identity management, security, and providers, and all the other sets of profiles we needed. So it consists of patient security, workflow, provider, and content management, as well as products to implement those. So all of these are needed to make XDS work. So in part three, we'll talk about the details of XDS. And in part four, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the early implementation issues. Thank you so far. Thank you.